billahi yessemi'l alimi mineşşeytanir recimi bismillahirrahmanirrahim Elhamdülillahi el ahad as samed allazi lem yulad ve lem yulad ve lem yekun lehu kufuan ahad Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidina ve habibina ve mevlana resulillah allazi da'ana ila riyad salihin وأرشدنا حتى نكون من المهتدين اللهم صل وسلم عليه في الأولين وفي الآخرين وتتقبل يا ربنا منا حتى نحق بالصالحين في جنتك النعيم يا رب العالمين إن شاء الله back to continue to read from Riyadh al-Salihin of Sayyidina Imam al-Nawi, rahimahullah. We reached the last hadith in the chapter on sincerity. And as I said uh, last week, this hadith is very important that we study if we're going to be like students of knowledge or content providers, that we study the usul, usul of fiqh, before we start to engage the adillah. And also for somebody to study the usul without the adillah is a problem. Like you need both. The usul without the adillah will lead to like being too laxed, like being too, too, too easy. And the adillah without usul, studying the evidences without, without their foundational principles may lead someone astray. So this hadith in front of us, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, it exemplifies this principle that I'm talking about right now, this idea. And that's the biggest problem for Muslims in America. It really are two. Number one, fuqara bijanib ma'rifati lughat al-arabiyya wa usuliha. The biggest problem is their lack of knowledge of Arabic. Even the Arabs. The second, especially for like students of knowledge, is that they, they join a group before they learn the usul. So they, they become indoctrinated by different philosophies within the community without having foundations. So then they get caught up. And then they become agents of division, agents of weakening the ummah. I want to say something to the Salafi brothers, man. I love you. You know, a brother came to me last week. He said, man, you're hard on the Salafis. I'm not trying to be hard on the Salafis. My teacher, I was Salafi when I became Muslim in the sense of the group Salafi, not, not the Sahaba. My Sheikh, Sheikh Al-Qasimi, was from Qasim. He was a student of Sheikh Ibn Uthameen, rahimahullah. And Sheikh Abdul Hamoud, I studied with him for three years from Yemen. He was a student of Sheikh Ibn Uthameen, rahimahullah. So... I want you to feel, I don't like this demonizing Salafi brothers. I don't like that. Just as I don't like people demonizing the Sufis and the Ash'aris and all this. As you see, as we study together, I don't have time for that kind of stuff. And for those of us who became Muslim, what did that give our children? Those divisions, where are our children now? Where are the institutions that we could have built? But instead, we brought Crips and Bloods. I used to be a Blood before I was Muslim. We brought that into our Islam. So we can have our differences, but I want to make sure everybody here, you feel welcome. And feel free. Suleiman came and asked me questions. It's good. Don't worry. I'm not that important. And so if there's anything that needs to be discussed or talked about, I'm always open to that. Alhamdulillah. Yes, brother. Come salam. Yeah. No, nah, it's a good question. So Imam al-Baydawi, he says, usul. Is ma'rifatu dala'il ijmaran. It's first of all to know the evidences. Second, wa kayfiyat istifadati minha. And this is where people get lost. How to benefit from the evidences. Like, how to benefit. So, for example, the hadith al kasiyat al ariyat, right? That at the end of times, you're going to see women, they're clothed, but they're naked. This hadith, it's sunnid as sahih, but it's matan as da'if. Right? You see a million memes everywhere with this. 
right? That there'll be women who come at the end of time. The Prophet is reported to have said, I never saw, I never saw them. They'll be kasiyat ariyat, clothed and naked. This hadith from Sayyidina Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu. But this hadith is mawquf ala Abi Huraira, meaning that's what Abu Huraira said. It's not what the Prophet said. So is it now a hadith or is the statement of Abu Huraira? The statement of Abu Huraira. Is the sunnah sahih? The sunnah is sahih. We have a great usul in Ahl sunnah that says, Sihatu sanad la tufid sihatu al-matan. Oh. How many people now going around just quote a hadith? I read it in Bukhari, I read it in Muslim. But they don't know this axiom. A sound sanad doesn't mean the matan is sound. The text is sound. So here's an example. I don't know the usul. I'm just out quoting a hadith like crazy. Making memes on TikTok, on Instagram. I'm hot. I got that energy. Another example, somebody prays like this, somebody prays like this, I go and say, you know, the person prays like this is deviant. From the usul, we know that if somebody prays like this, doesn't cancel his salah. And we know what Sayyidina Imam al-Shafi say to us, this is from the usul, that issues of ijtihad, remember this axiom tonight, we should not fight over them. How many issues in the community are ijtihad that Muslims are fighting over? The majority. But how many times we find Muslims fighting over the usul, the foundations of deen? So every, every year in Ramadan, the moon, how many raka'at taraweeh, all that's issues of ijtihad. We shouldn't even fight over it. So the point I'm making is usul will balance us. Doesn't mean that we can't differ. Doesn't mean that we don't have even passionate conversations about it. But we keep it as brothers as sisters, we don't create enemies of each other that we see now. So that's an example. So Imam al-Baydawi said in Al-Minhaj, it's an important book in Usul al-Fiqh. Usul al-Fiqh, ma'rifatu dala'il ijmal, and to generally know what are the evidences. Because nowadays, we find people bringing in, like the liberals and the conservatives, bringing into the religion, what are considered evidences from the religion? That's a problem. Idkhalu fi deen ma laysa minhu aslan. So what is a dalil? What, what is the conditions for something to be in evidence is usul. And Imam Farhan, I think he's teaching a class on usul al fiqh. He's going to start, he told me, mashallah. The second part of usul al fiqh, that's why if you speak Arabic, it's not aslu fiqh. It's what? Usul al jama. It's the plural. Usul al fiqh. The foundations of Islamic law, not the foundation. It's usul. Because talatat asha. Ma'rifatu dala'il. Wa kayfiyat. How do you benefit from the evidences? So many people, they know the evidences. They don't know how to benefit from the evidences. So they make something that's wajib, makru. They make something makru, that's wajib. They make something that's haram, halal. Something's halal, haram. They have an evidence. They don't know how to use the evidence. This happened in the times of the Sahaba. The third part of usul al-fiqh, وَحَالَ المستفد. Ah, What's the conditions of the one who qualifies to benefit from the evidences? What is the academic qualifications? May Allah bless you. Somali tea? <laughs> Allahu Akbar, man. Just need some banana, bananas and rice. Siyatak fiyanna, alhamdulillah. So, three definitions of usul al-fiqh. Knowing the evidences, knowing how to use them correctly. And then what are the qualifications needed? Who's, who's the one that has academically qualified his or herself for doing this? Well, Sayyidina al-Baydawi says, وَاسْتِدْلَالُ بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَبِسُنَّةِ رَسُولِهِ مَبْنِيَّةٌ عَلَى مَعْرِفَةِ لُغَةِ وَأَقْسَامِهَا First thing al-Baydawi says in al-Minhaj, in order to benefit from the evidences, the first thing someone has to master is the language. And understanding the depths of the language. That's why in Azhar in high school, we memorized all those Abiyat al Shi'r, Mutanabi, and uh, Ahmed Shawqi, and Amr al Qais, Mu'alaqat al Sabi, all that old language. Why? Because that's the, as Sayyidina Umar said, Alaykum bi diwan al Arab, fi inna fiha tafsiru kitabikum. Right? Sayyidina Umar said, You should learn the poetry of the Arabs because that explains the book of Allah. So you have someone that's well rounded. So what is Usul? We're going to model that for you tonight, inshallah, uh, Shaykh. So knowing what are, knowing the usul will help us understand correctly. One of my teachers used to say, Ma'rifatul usul tajlibul fuhul. 
<laughs> right? If you know, who knows, also became a man, became a good human being, became a good woman. That's why Sayyidina Ashokani, what's the name of his book? Irshad, huh? Al Fuhul ila ilmi al Usul. That's why Shokani's book in Usul of Fiqh is called Guiding Human Beings, Al Fuhul. Yeah. They reach the epitome of their human ability through Usul. Fakhalas, ya Shaykh. Sorry about that. The first hadith on Abi, or the last hadith of this chapter, on Abi Abdul Rahman Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al Khattab, radiallahu anhum aqal. Samiatu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaku in talaku thalathatu, or in talaka thalathatu nafri mimma kana kabalakum. Hatta awahum al mabitu ila gharim. فانحضرت الصخرة من الجبر فصدت عليهم الغارة والغارة هو مفعول به منصوب. The hadith begins said that a group of three people they were out and they were forced to take refuge at night in a cave until subhanallah they went in that cave and suddenly a rock came on them and blocked fell and blocked the cave. We talked about early on the belief in al-qada wal qadr. That good and bad are from Allah. That's the belief of Ahl Sunnah. Sometimes people get confused. Didn't shaitan create bad? This is shirk. And the shaitan hum makhluq. Allah says in the Quran, Allahu khaliqu kulli shay. Allah created everything, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here when a Muslim realizes that everything is from Allah, it's not easy, then they will achieve a sense of peace with good and evil. They won't become intoxicated by success. They won't be destroyed by difficulties. You didn't see these three guys say, man, why Allah do this to us? Allah hates me. That's why he did this to me. That's like having a bad idea about Allah. But the believer, subhanAllah, everything is from Allah. Either I'm going to be patient, alhamdulillah, or grateful, alhamdulillah. Imam Ibn Qayyim, he said that the life of the believer rests between thankfulness and patience. That's it. فَقَالُوا إِنَّهُ لَا يُنْجِيكُمْ مِنْ هَذِهِ السَّخْرَةِ إِلَّا أَن تَدْعُوا اللَّهَ بِصَالِهِ أَعْمَالِكُمْ Then one of them said, the only thing that's going to save us, man, is Allah. Think about the ummah today. We're like these people in this cave. Palestine, Kashmir, Shishan, Somal, Kenya, Mari, Chad. So many things happening. So many challenges. Everywhere you look, you feel like you're in the cave. I'm in the cave and we're, we're blocked in. لا ينجينا من هذه سخرة إلا أن نفر إلى الله. The only thing that's going to save us from that is to flee to Allah. As long as we flee, Muhammad Al Ghazali, rahimahullah, the great Egyptian scholar, he said, as long as Muslims flee to everything but Allah, they will find nothing. كأنهم حمر مستنفرة فرت من قسورة. Just running. When are we going to come back to Allah as an ummah? As we're going to talk about وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ All of you turn to Allah. The whole ummah has to come back to Allah. So the rock is in front of us. Rocks in our lives. Maybe they're micro rocks. Our marriages, our kids. Subhanallah, last six months I've been in the doctor's office more than my entire life, man. Allah bless our wives. My wife, her, her delivery was very difficult, man. Today, before the dars, <laughs> doctor's office. So what, what is going to save us? Of course, we have to work because immediately the secular mind, when you say, flee to Allah, are you saying neglect the dunya? If you flee to Allah, you're going to know how to use the dunya. But when are you going to stop fleeing to the dunya? And that's why the Prophet said, what I fear for you the most is dunya. 
is this world. فَإِنَّهُ لَا يُنْجِيكُمْ مِنْ هَذِهِ السَّخْرَةِ إِلَّا أَنْ تَدْعُوا اللَّهَ بِصَالِهِ أَعْمَالِكُمْ The only thing that's going to save you from this rock is to flee to Allah. Sometimes we have trouble with our children, man. It's hard, especially as they get older because they don't, they don't turn out to be what we wanted. First of all, that's not our business. That's the business of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sheikh Abdul Wahab al-Sha'rani. There's a door, actually a gate in, in, in Cairo called Bab al-Sha'rani, named after him, mashallah. He was one of the great, great scholars. And his son was, was tough, man. His son was, was kind of lost, you know. And in his memoirs, he said, and, and from mothers and fathers, listen to this. This really impacted me when I read it. He said, you know, I was really upset with my son because he was Sheikh al-Islam of his time. Sheikh Abdul Wahab al-Sha'rani was like one of the great scholars of his era. I mean, you have a gate named after you? Like, can you imagine if you have a gate named after you in D.C.? It's, like it's a monument. It's not a gate. It's like 75 feet high. It's huge. And so he, he was saying in his memoirs, man, my son, you know, my son is tripping, man. Out here, knucklehead won't listen to me and I'm, I'm Sheikh al-Islam I'm this, I'm this, I'm this and then in his writings he said that's the problem I'm saying I, I, I and he said I forgot the statement in the Quran Ufawidu amri ila Allah fafawadtu amribni ila Rabbi he said so I read in Surah Al-Ghafir I, I surrender everything to Allah he said now I surrender my son to Allah it has nothing to do with me and mashallah over some time his son became better so here they have like a stone in front of them. It's an insurmountable situation. And they do what the believer does. This is the issue of tawassul. Here we go. This issue has snarled Muslims forever, man. We know that Ahl Sunnah, they agree. Tawassul means to, to seek you know, the barakah of something in your dua with Allah. The first two, everyone agrees on. Tawassul bi asma'illah. So like, I seek help in my dua. I seek the blessings of my dua through the names of Allah. The second, from this hadith, we're going to learn through the good I've done. Oh Allah, you know, I memorized the Quran for this. Or, oh Allah, I did this. Accept it from me. And I ask you by the barakah of that amal. I'm not asking the amal. I'm asking you by the blessing of the amal that you put in that amal to accept this from me. This is in Surah Ma'idah. The third is where Muslims differ. Sunnis. And that is tawassul bi Sayyidina Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To make tawassul bi ja'i Rasulillah. Oh Allah, I ask you by the blessings of the Prophet The majority of Ahlul Sunnah, as mentioned by Abu Amr ibn Salah, they have no problem with this. The four madhabs in general have no problem with this. Although there are some details, for example, Imam Ahmed, there's two statements of his. In one of them he says, I restrict this only with the Prophet not with Salihin, because we know there's a difference of opinion about with the righteous people. Oftentimes we find people dividing themselves over this issue. So some people will say those people who make tawassul with the Prophet some they're out of Islam. Um kuffar. Yani. And we find people who say those who say we shouldn't make tawassul, they're out of Islam. <laughs> then what do you have left? Masakin. Just want to raise our kids. But it's important to note that tawassul has never been traditionally from the bab of aqidah. Never. It was never considered from usul al-din. It was considered from the issues of ijtihad. From bab fiqh. The word fiqh is synonymous with ijtihad. Imam Ahmed ibn al-Hanbal, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, we don't make takfir of people who do this because this is from bab ijtihad. Not min bab aqidah. 
It's from fiqh, not belief. And I want my Salafi brothers to write this down. Because this is the quote of a shaykh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Rahimahullah. Who, he wrote a number of letters to his followers. And the 21st letter is published. You can find it. Alhamdulillah. Page number 64. Page number 21 as, page, as well as page number 264. He said, "Iftara alayya umuran lam aqulha." I'm quoting the Sheikh. He said, "People have lied about things I never said. They lied about me. They are saying things that I have never said in my life." And I'll, I'll give the quote again so you can go find it because this is not to attack anybody, but it's like we have to chill on making takfir of people, man. And also the Sufis, stop making takfir of the Salafis. Stop. Trying to destroy them. Demon Who wins if we demonize each other? The enemies of Islam. Learn how to differ. How, learn how to talk through differences. To communicate. Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, said, Iftara aliyya, ay, iftara nas aliyya umuran lam aqulha. Wa lam yati ala bari. And I, I, I didn't even have any concern about these issues. So people are saying, and this happened to me, people said things about me, well, I never said it in my life. There's a Facebook page dedicated to something I said, I never said it. I said, well, I, when did I say that? But said, now, Sheikh, he said, لم أقول بها ولم يأتي ببالي. I never said it, and I never thought about it. What are those things? أني أكفير that I declare those people who make tawassal with the righteous or the prophet as kuffar. Who said that? Who, who said that? A Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab. You know how he died? He died under house arrest. Who do you think put him in house arrest? The same people that got Salman al in jail. وَجَوَابِ عَنْ هَذَا أن أقول سبحانك هذا بهتان عظيم. He said the only thing I have to say about people saying I said this is glorified by Allah. This is a tremendous lie against me. So you got to be careful, man. And you have to be careful. People say things about Ibn Taymiyyah that he never said, never did. People say Ibn Taymiyyah, he got on a minbar and went up and down. And then he said, this is how God goes up and down. He didn't say that. You ask him, where did he say that? In the, in the writings of Ibn Battuta. When did the writings of Ibn Battuta become something that we rely upon historically? You know why? There's no sonad to the, Ibn Battuta. He didn't write that. That was written by Ibn Majhul. Someone who's not known. But sometimes, man, the heart, when it, when it needs to find an enemy... To create a sense of value, you can't be sincere with the ulama. You can't be sincere with the scholars. Doesn't mean I agree with everything or you agree with everything. I don't agree with half the things I say. But we, this is ridiculous that we fight and destroy each other over this. And this leaves us open to intelligence agencies that can come amongst us and destroy us. Again, this is from Majmu'a al Rasail of a Shaykh. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah. Page number two, it's actually two places. Because one page he said, they said I, I should burn the book Dala'il Khayrat. He said, I never said that. I never did that. And they said that I, I make takfir of people who do this. And then he says, why? He said what all Ahl Sunnah said. This is an issue of fiqh. What does it mean by fiqh here? Ijtihad. Scholars differ on it. They have evidence. It's not something fixed like salah is five times a day. And so that's how the usul helps us, Akhi. Uncle, I'm sorry, my dear older brother. I ain't going to call you uncle. I'm not trying to get jumped. My beautiful elder in Islam. That, because when I called my man uncle last week, he almost jumped me. That usul helps us not make fire where there's no fire to be made. And, and allows us to be mature enough to navigate our community and to appreciate one another. 
So again, the statement of Sayyidina Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. This is in his Majmu' Rasail, page numbers, six, uh, 264 and pages number 21. Specifically, you can look under the 21st Risala that he wrote to his followers. Qala rajulu minhum. One of them said, Allahumma. The word Allahumma means, because meme is always used to sow plurality. Say, anta, anti, antuma, an, tum, bil meme. Meme always means like a plural. Ka, ki, kuma, kum, meme. It's the Arabs, when they use the word meme at the end of certain pronouns and things, it implies plurality. That's why Imam Ibn Qayyim says in Jala'il Afham, he said that the word Allahumma, and this is according to Sibuwi, great scholar from Persia, that the word meme, when you say Allahumma, you ask Allah by all of his names and attributes, subhanAllah. So this person, he said, Allahumma. He said, Oh Allah, I used to have very old parents. Very old parents are very old and weak and fragile. And I hated to... to أغبق means to make like a vessel of something. Here he means milk. I hated to provide that to anyone before them. From my family or my property. And he said, Then I became busy, you know, getting firewood and things like this. Arih means to return. So I, I didn't return to them until I found them sleeping. Mm. Also, there's a lesson here that is, is good to work. He's going out and getting firewood. He's still salih, but he works. And to be in khidmah to our families. And so I went and prepared this milk for them. And then I found that they were sleeping. I was late. SubhanAllah. And I, I, I didn't want to wake them up and I hated to serve them before anyone else in my family. So I waited. And I was holding it like this. He said, so I waited until Fajr came and my children were crying at my feet. Mm. And they woke up and they drank their fill. Allahumma in kuntu fa'altu dharika b'tiga awajhik ففرج عنا ما نحن فيه فانفرجت السخرة ولا يستطيعون الخروج منه and then he said oh Allah if I did that for you if I did that for, for ikhlas we talked about what ikhlas means then move this rock and the Prophet said the rock moved What's going to move the Ummah now? All the problems we face. None of us talking about ikhlas. To be sincere. He said the rock moved a little bit and they were not able to get out though. As we finish, before salah, and then we'll continue, inshallah. Maybe somebody asked, man, they going to go home and give their family the blues. <laughs> 
I don't have to do anything for you. It's all about my parents. And as Malcolm X taught us, in-laws are outlaws. And sometimes we see mother-in-laws, they get jealous. You love, you, you love your wife more than me. Isn't that what you wanted to happen? Isn't that a, a sign that you're a great mother? So this issue that we're reading now is contrary to the sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In Islamic law, we have an axiom. I mentioned it last week. Al-furu' muqaddam ala al-usul. That those, those family, the family that we take through like a contract is given precedence in, in many situations with our, our parents. So as we finish, and we'll talk about this after Isha because of the adhan. This and the next narration are what's called from a sharia man qablana. The sharia of those who preceded us. And we're going to talk about what this means in usul al-fiqh. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ مُكَلَّفًا بِشَرْعِي صَلَّى عَلَيْهِ اللَّهُ قَبَلَ الْوَضْعِي In this poem, we memorize an usul al-fiqh. مراق السعود. In the Maliki Madhab. He said that the Prophet, مَا كَنْ مُكَلَّفًا قَبَلَ الْوَضْعِي أي قَبَلَ الْوَحِي مَا كَنْ مُكَلَّفًا بِشَرْعِيَّةِ مَنْ قَبَلَهُ قَبَلَ الْوَحِي What does that mean? That the Prophet was not before he was a prophet, worshipping with the sharia of those who came before him. مَا كَنْ مُكَلَّفًا بِهَا Because he, was, he wasn't a prophet yet. But then how do we understand, because sometimes we find people, they're really passionate in interfaith work, they start trying to like give us the rulings from the Torah on the Mimbar. Like, slow down, bro. You know what I'm saying? Quoting the King James Version from the Mimbar, trying to teach us about Ramadan. Or they go into non-Muslim spaces and they misuse texts. That's how Usul helps us, Shaykh, Shaykh, to stay prophetic. So after Salat al-Isha, inshaAllah, and Ba'd al-Isha Asha, after Isha, we're going to finish this hadith and start Bab Tawbah, but we're going to talk about two very important axioms. And the first is the sharia of those that preceded us. How do we understand it? How do we engage it? Because the next narration, if we just leave it as it is, without usul, is problematic. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bid tawfiqi wa sadad. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Also, uh, with as salihin uh, uh, with tawassal also, it's agreed upon to ask the righteous people to make dua for you. And the Prophet said to Sayyidina Umar, don't forget me in dua when he went to Umrah. So this individual, he served his mother and father. Now we're talking about a sharia min qablina, or man qablana. Well, Sayyidina Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we say, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ مُكَلَّفًا بِالشَّرْعِ صَلَّى عَلَيْهِ اللَّهُ قَابَلَ الْوَضْعِ That before, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before he was a prophet, he wasn't worshipped and using the other sharia, nor were they as a reference point for him. عَلَيْهِ السَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ This is according to Sayyidina Imam Malik. وَهُوَ وَالْأُمَّةُ كُلِّفَا after the Prophet became a Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, he and his ummah, it's agreed upon, are held responsible for the sharia of those who preceded us. But I have to make a very delicate point here about this. Because sometimes people take this the wrong way. And that's why Sidi Abdullahi in this poem, he says, Illa idha taklifu bi nasin tafa wa qila la hu khulfu fi ma shuri'a In this poem, Walam yakun da'in ilayhi sumi'a Hakadha al-abiyat My memory is getting old, man. But Sidi Abdullahi in this poem, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to the Maliki school, Imam Malik and most of Ahl sunnah before he was a prophet, he wasn't expected to follow the sharia of those who came before him. After prophethood, he and his ummah, this became a responsibility. But we have to be very careful and make this point. 
Sheikh, he says, but what that means is what is in our sharia. What, what the difference is, is what is in the Quran. Al-Aynu bil for example, in Surah Al-Ma'idah. You find this in the Torah. So most ulama said, Muhayman Ali. The Quran is Muhayman Ali. So it doesn't mean we go to the other books and start reading them and we take sharia from those books. It means the sharia that is mentioned in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some ulama said that's not, not the sharia that agrees with the sharia that came before the time of the Prophet. Some ulama, they said that's not the shari their sharia, that's our sharia. Other ulama said, la, because it sanctioned what came before it, it's an extension of what? Their sharia as approved by what? The sharia of who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. The actions of this individual are not sanctioned by the sharia of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So therefore we should understand them and we shouldn't use, and this is where we said usul, I'm going to go home and tell my family, yeah, there's this hadith that says, you know, I can make the kids cry and ignore you from my parents. That's what happens when we don't know usul. We, we create more problems. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, قَالَ الْآخَرُ O oh Allah, Allahumma, innahu kanat li abnatu ammi, kanat ahabba nas ilay. The second man, he said, my cousin, my uncle's daughter, she was the most beloved human being to me. Another narration, wa kuntu uhibha, I loved her. More than like, like any love a man, a man could have for a woman. Here also we learn a lesson that there's good love, there's bad love. This is desire. This is shahwa. It's not love. It's not wa ja'ala baynakum mawaddatan wa rahma. This is just shahwa. And this man, he says, and here we learn a very important lesson, by the way, in this hadith as we finish. That in certain situations, it's allowed to mention your sins. Because now he's going to mention a very serious sin in front of other people. But the general rule is not to reveal our sins. Ra said, Kullu ummati, everyone in my ummah is forgiven except al mujahareen, except those who reveal their sins. So, as we'll talk about if we get to the chapter on Tawbah today, inshallah. There are certain situations where people are allowed to say things which regularly wouldn't be accepted. Necessity allows the forbidden if it's in the correct amount. So he said like, and also we learn it's allowed to say you love somebody. None of the people around him said, Astaghfirullah, how you say you loved her? Astaghfirullah, bro. Check yourself, B. Fear Allah. He didn't say he loved her. He said, I love her more than anything else. That any man could love a woman. But sometimes love is not really love. It's deception. So I tried to force her to be with me. From Tana'at. And she prohibited me. And this happened for years until finally she was hit with poverty. And she came to me, she asked for money, I gave her money. And he says, عشرين, not, don't say عشرين, ah. like بطيخ is eh, بطيخ, ya sheikh. بطيخ la b. عشرين na عشرين. The lisan cuts shway. So عشرين وميت دنانير. Here we learn something from this hadith. When that man was alive, were there dananir? This man, when he, when he raped this woman, he tried, attempted rape. When he tried to do this, were there, was the currency in this ancient time dananir? No. So he learned a lesson from the Prophet Sallallahu that the da'iyah can use things in the culture so people can understand. So now instead of saying dananir, if you're talking to someone, what would you say? 100 what? 
120 what? Or Bitcoin. He said, I gave her 120 Bitcoin. That she will be alone with me. What he means here is this is the definition of khilwa. People get it confused. Khilwa isn't like you're here in the masjid and you walk in the hallway and there's a sister in the hallway or a brother in the hallway. Imam Malik said the khilwa is where you could be alone and have intercourse and nobody would know about it. Hadhu khilwa. So I, 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 I made this condition with her. That if I gave her this money, she will be with me. In a physical way, in a haram way. And then he said, I was about to have this illicit relationship with her, and just at that moment that this was about to happen, then she said to me, Fear Allah. And we talked about the da'ya, in any moment we'll make da'wah. That the person never gives up on Allah. We learned a lesson from this incredible woman. She had no hope except in Allah. Fear, at least fear Allah. Now we see young, young Muslims move into this kind of immature, irrational, machismo, most kafir men. Sisters try to tell us, fear Allah. That fear Allah. Don't. Violate me without the haq, without nikah. Wallahi, there's a story of a brother. I'll finish. This is one of the converts. We have our own stories. Tabaqat al aslamu. The mausua of those who became Muslim. I don't like converts, new Muslims. There was a brother years ago. He was making dawah. Train station in New York. He wasn't married, you know. No Muslim is hard to get married because you don't have the social structure. You don't have aunties that can go talk to the girl you want to marry's parents because your, your family like, talk to who? What? Just go handle your own business. So that brother, he saw this woman on, on the subway and he, he fancied her and they developed a relationship every day. He would sell incense and oils and, and he'd give her pamphlets and books about Islam. And then finally, Shaitan got him, man, so he threw the Mac on her, you know. He tried to talk to her, and she responded. He said, then we dated three or four months. We went out, and then finally, astaghfirullah, we got into a situation like this, and the brother said, just as I was about, you know, to fall into something I would regret, she said to me, wait a minute, aren't you Muslim? This non-Muslim woman said it to him, aren't you Muslim? I read in the books that you gave me that we're not supposed to do this now. You're supposed to marry me because I'm alu kitab. Alu kitab. Like alu parata. Then he said, the brother said, I made toba and I ran out. I never saw the woman again. So be careful, man. Jahiliya got light in it. So we'll come back, inshallah. We'll continue. This hadith, barakallahu feekum wa sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina Muhammad wa sallam alaykum wa rahmatullah. Inshallah, we're going to continue reading from Riyad Salihin, this long hadith about these three individuals who are trapped in a cave behind a rock. And they invoked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by some deeds that they did and things that they didn't do. So this hadith Actually, the entire edifice of the Sharia is found in this hadith. Because either the Sharia is commanding us to do something, if that's a complete command, it's fard. If it's a negotiable command, sunnah. Or it's commanding us to avoid things. If it's immutable in its command to avoid something, that's what? Haram. If it's not immutable, it's not linked to the hellfire, it's not linked to any type of punishment, it's called makru, disliked. And then the fourth, or fifth, excuse me, al-mubah, permissibility. 
The permissible are the most. Out of all the different rulings, the permissible are the most. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا Allah made everything in the earth for you. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, جُعِلَتْ لِيَّ الْأَرْضُ مَسْجِدًا تَهُورًا كَمَا رَوَاهُ مُسْلِمٌ the Prophet said, the whole earth was made a masjid for me and pure for me. And this great axiom in Islamic law from the usul, ya Shaykh, your question. Shaykh and yasal an ma thamarat ma'rifati usul fiqh. Faman ya'rifu al-usul lam yakun fulan. Lam yakun jahilan yan. So the, 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 the purpose of learning usul is not to be a fool. Because one of the worst things we can do, an taqulu ala Allahi mala ta'lamun. To say something about Allah without knowledge. Hun. He's asking, where can we learn all sort of fiqh? Sheikh uh, Imam Farhan is going to teach a book, I believe. But in, in this class, usul tatbiqi. tatbiqi. We're going to practice usul. So you can see how it's applied, like here now. So when I read this hadith, I'm not going to say, oh wow, let me go be mean to my wife and kids because of my parents. خلاص يعني. الفروع مقدم على أصول. Second part, this man. قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وعنه بالإسناد قال قال الآخر اللهم he said, you know, I have this cousin of mine. She was the most beautiful woman. I was attracted to her. I tried to force her to have a relationship with me. We understand something what's called ima an nas Something that isharat an nas What's understood from the text is that to assault a person, uh, to assault a woman is bad. Yani, because why? He's saying it in this place of desperation. And this is the second component of Sharia. Not to do, but to what? To stop. Al fi'l wa tark. The first one, he treated his parents that way, he's doing an action. This guy, what's he going to do? Fansaraftu. I stopped. When she told me, Ittaqillah. Fear Allah. Don't, don't violate this khatama. Illa bi haqi. Don't do this. And he stopped. Fahada tark. Alas. Then he mentions how she was suffering and he paid her and he made a contract with her that if she took this money from him then she would have a bad relationship with him. In their sharia that's different than our sharia. In our sharia sisters this is defined as rape. It's different than the American definition of rape. Imam Malik, in fact, you find the Sharia is more broad, more, more, shall I say, liberal in its definition of rape than secular law. I'm not using liberal, of course, in, the, in that way, the linguistic way. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, in al atabiyyah when he defined al-ikhtisab, ikhtisab is rape. He said, rahimahullah, an example of this is to force a woman to have intercourse with you and you pay her. Huh? That's our sharia. Then they ask Sayyidina Imam Malik, وَأَنَا مَالِكِي بِلَا تَعَصُّبِ يعني Don't worry, I'm not like Maliki uh, hardcore. قَالَ Malik, Sisters, he was asked about the man who does this. قَالَ الْحَدْ Poof. He should be killed. Don't go and kill nobody, man. This is the opinion of Malik. وَالصَّدَّاقَ And he should pay her. So there should be financial remuneration. هَذَا فِي الْمَدِينَةِ هذا كان إمام المدينة كان إمام دار الهجرة 
Rahimahullah. In the books of fiqh, we find some people, they said some really unfortunate things to people who are the victims of sexual assault, especially women. First of all, they said the zina. So if a, a, a woman is to come forward and say, someone has violated me sexually or harmed me, this happened unfortunately in Pakistan in the 80s when the, the law, alhamdulillah, later on the ulama, mashallah, they came and changed this, but some people, they said she has to bring four witnesses. If she doesn't bring four witnesses, then she should be punished. How on earth are you going to be raped and have four witnesses? So if you look at the classical books of fiqh, rape is not under the section on zina. My American brothers don't say zina. Zina, ya sheikh. Don't say zina. Zina is something else. Zina. And this, this has unfortunately caused young men also and women that have been the victim of sexual assault to be scared to come forward. Because they can't bring four witnesses. But if you look at Madhab Hanafi, Madhab Shafi, Madhab Maliki, Madhab Hanbali, Madhab Al Imami, Imamiya, yani, you're going to find that sexual assault doesn't, doesn't exist under zina, under the hudud. It exists under what? Al Jarh. What's Al Jarh? Personal injury law. It's considered an injury, assault. And you find like Imam Malik, definitions of sexual assault that are actually more wide in their scope than secular law because Islam is a religion that's worried about sexual impropriety, of course. The second is that when a person comes forward, their identity should be hidden. Why? Because to reveal their identity initially would be a form of shaming them. And we're not allowed to shame any Muslim. Or to embarrass them. That's why Imam Malik and Al-Muatta, inshallah, we can teach the Muatta when we finish this, inshallah, in, in about six years. Muatta will take 15 years. Imam Malik and the Muatta fathers was asked about a daughter who had been violated. Does her father have to tell a suitor that she has been Violated. And he said it is obligatory upon him to hide that. SubhanAllah. That's our father. Not just anybody online. That's our father. Well, like Islam is a beautiful religion, man. But when we don't know it, we make it ugly. But Sayyidina Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also taught us, as we're going to learn in a minute, as we take from this hadith that it, for her, or him, I've seen young boys, unfortunately, also have been assaulted. Ha'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. Sometimes even by people who claim to teach the Qur'an. Why do you teach the Qur'an? Go and be shaitan, ya shaykh. Well, I would rather have a jahil teach the Qur'an who loves our children than a scholar of Qur'an who teaches our children badly. Sah? Because then we have to raise kids that hate the religion. Why? Then we begin to unpack what happened to them. That's why I tell parents, when you parent, don't build guilt, build awareness. Why are your children the way they are? Well, like one time, subhanAllah, one sister came into our office when I was in New York with a copy of the Quran. And she said, I feel bad what I'm about to say. Can someone take this Quran from me? I don't want this Quran in my house. She said, please don't say I'm kafir. Look how scared she was. We're so quick to call people kufar. It's like we're more happy people are kufar than they are Muslim. <laughs> so we asked her. She said, because the sheikh raped me. Hundreds of times. Who taught me this Quran. I asked her, does anyone know about this? She said, no. Ya Allah. So the, the next, it's not ghibah, as we're going to talk about in a minute, for someone to Make this accusation if it's true. If it's not true, of course, that's a problem. But if this accusation is true, that doesn't it's not considered slander or backbiting. So this woman 
This man, he left her. Why he didn't marry her? Because he's Majnun. And also, I doubt she wanted to marry him after he showed this horrible treatment. It's crazy. People say, you should marry the person that sexually assaulted you. Why, why would I marry the person that sexually assaulted me? What kind of option is that? That's like double the punishment. Fatarakaha, he says, uh, I left her and then I left also the money I gave her. Allahumma in kuntu fa'atu dharika abtigha'a wajhika fafruj anna ma nahnu fi fanfarajit asakhratu ghayra annahum la yistati'una al-khuruja minha. Then he made dua, oh Allah, if I did this for your sake, I feared you for your sake and I, I didn't do this and I did all this. Move the rock and the rock moved a little bit but they couldn't get out. Also we learned a lesson that no matter how bad the sin, don't let shaitan win. Well, I Sufyan ibn Uyayna Somebody asked him, he said, I'm such a bad person. Will Allah accept my dua? He said, Allah accept the dua of shaitan. Give me some time. Allah gave him time. He said, Hatta Allah, he answered the dua of shaitan. You're not shaitan. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, وَأَعْطَيْتُهُمْ أَجْرَهُمْ غَيْرَ رَجْلٍ وَاحِدٍ تَرَكَ الَّذِي لَهُ وَذَهَبْ Third guy, he said, you know, I 1099 some employees, man. I rented some employees. Not everything in this hadith is from the sharia of those who came before us. What we learn from this hadith are certain things are from our sharia, like renting, employment, other things, working, tawassul, but there are other parts of this hadith which are mansukha bi shariati muhammadiyya alayhi salatu wasalam. So he said, you know, I hired some people and I paid every, them, every one of them except one guy. He left and he left his payment that I had for him. Fathamartu mm. أَجْرَهُ حَتَّى كَثُورَةِ يعني كَثُورَ يَكْثُورُ يا شيخ Not كَثُورَ يَكْثِيرُ كَثُورَتْ مِنْهُ الْأَمْوَالِ So that guy, he left. And I took the money that he left and I invested it and it grew. Here we learn a lesson that if someone leaves someone a considerable amount of wealth, ulama's differ about the time of how long they left it. Are you allowed to invest it? Yeah, but if they come back for it, you have to what? You have to give it back to them. This also is a proof. I want to open the door now. You can talk to the imam about stocks and hiring someone like an investment agent to work your money, blah, 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 blah. This hadith. He said, so, mashallah, I, I got down with the money, man. فَجَاءَ بَعْدَ حِينٍ فَقَالَ يَا عَبْدَ اللَّهِ أَدِّي إِلَيَّ أَجْرِي Then he came back, he said, O servant of Allah. Here we see the importance of dhikr. The woman, when she was being assaulted, what did she say? اِتَّقِي الله, Fear Allah. This guy, when he wants to make sure he gets his, 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 his payment, what does he say to him? يَا عَبْدَ الله. So dhikr being used to remind people, to center people. أَدِّي إِلَيَّ Ajri, give me back, give me my, my money, what I earned. Ah. فَقُطُ كُلَّ مَا تَرَى مَا أَجْرِكِ So everything that you see here is yours, man. He said, مِنَ الْإِبِلْ وَالْبَقَرَ وَالْغَنَمْ وَالْرَقِيقِ The hadith, he said, all the camels, the cows, the sheep, the sir, the slaves, everything you see is yours. Ya Abdullah, la tastahi bi. He said, don't play with me. He said, wallahi la astahzi ubik. He said, I'm not playing with you. It's yours. Fa'akhadahu mm. <laughs> kulla. <laughs> so he took everything. Fa'astasqahu falab yatruk shay'an. He didn't leave anything, he took it all. Allahumma, oh Allah. 
إن كنت فعلت ذلك ابتغاء وجهك. If I did that for you sincerely. فافرج عنا ما نحن فيه. Move the stone. Nowadays, if we look at the Muslim community, we have issues with our parent, our family. We have issues with marriages. We have is- issues with business. <laughs> it's right here in front of us. If we want to move the stones in our community, these are three things we should focus on. Family, marriage, and doing right by each other in business. Wallahi, unfortunately, the worst business I ever did in my life was with a Muslim. Took everything from me. Everything. I didn't have much. How many mine, bro? Come on, bro. Took the, you know, the Prius, bro, and my Boost Mobile. Everything. Last year. Nobody knows about it. Almost had to close my school. I told him, man, why me, bro? He's like, you know, it's got to get paid, man. I was like, it's got to get paid. Okay. I'll meet you with Allah. So he said, oh, Allah, if I did this for you, remove this stone. And the stone moved and they left. What's the last lesson we take from this hadith? What if one of them was a bad person? <laughs> what if one of them was like, I ain't did no good, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any good to ask by. The importance of who we hang out with. Because good friends will get you out of a cave. Hmm. Khalil. Person on the religion of their friends. Imam al Qurtubi, he has a great reflection of Sultan Kaf. He says, sometimes hanging out with a dog is better than people. Because at least a dog is more loyal. Takes it to the next chapter, inshallah. We're just going to read a little bit from it and then we're going to stop. But alhamdulillah, bi fadlillah. Alhamdulillah, rahi, inshallah. Khatimna. Hadha al bab bab al ikhlas. Intahina min bab al ikhlas. We finish now the section on ikhlas. Now the second chapter. Qala al shaykh wa anhu qab al isnad babu at tawbah. We said the word bab means the door. Because when you go into someone's house, you enter their bab, you have etiquette. I have etiquette. And when I greet someone into my house, I have what? Etiquette. So the word bab, for students of knowledge, contains all the conditions of the teacher and the student. In one word, bab. هذا باب العلم. يعني كأنك تخش تدخل المكان. تخش البيت. You go into a house. When you go into a house, how do you act? How do I act? We act nice. We don't act unruly. And when I meet someone, من كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليكرم ضيفه. I'm good to my guest. So some people wonder, why does it say bab, bab? What's all this bab? And the bab is al-bab min al-adab. <laughs> the word bab from adab, to remind us to have adab. Also, to remind us of abwab al-jannah. So like every time we read a chapter, we renew, no jaddid, aniyya. Bab al-tawbah. The word tawbah means repentance. Qal al-ulama. Qal al-sidna al-shaykh al-imam. النووي رحمه الله قال التوبة واجبة واجبة من كل ذنب. He said Tawbah is obligatory for every sin. What he means here is two types of Tawbah. Like if it's an egregious sin, I make Tawbah. Oh Allah, I repent, I make Dua. But also for minor sins, Astaghfirullah. We're going to talk about that in the, in the future. So at least Istighfar. فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفر إنه كان توابا. قال فإن كانت المعصية بين العبد وبين الله أي لا تتعلق بحق الحق الأدمي. He said if if this mistake is not between a person and other people, meaning it's just between him and Allah سبحانه وتعالى or her and Allah فلها ثلاثة شروط. Then it has three شروط. The word شرط is translated as condition, but we need to define it. According to Islamic epistemolog- epistemological kind of terminology, nomenclature. ما يجب ما يجب بعدمه العدم ولا يجب بوجوده الوجود. Ah, هذا هو الشرط. Shart is that if it's gone, the mushtarat is gone, the mashrut is gone. For example, wudu. Wudu is a condition of salah. If I don't have wudu, do I have salah? Ah, فعدمه يفيد يجلب Al-Adam. That's called shart in Arabic. In our understanding, what he means now is if these are gone, the tawbah is not happening. 
So just like wudu is for salah, a shart min shurut is salah, these are the conditions of tawbah. فَيَجِبُ بِعَدَمِهِ عَدَمَ الْفِعِلِ عَدَمَ الْمَشْرُوطِ This is important. You need to remember this. So if I'm not doing it, it's not happening. لَكِنْ لَا يَجِبُ بِوُجُودِهِ الْوُجُودِ If I make wudu, does that make salah happen? No. That's a shart. It's conditional. فقال سيدنا مولانا فإن كانت المعصية بين العبد وبين الله سبحانه وتعالى إيه لا تتحقق أو لا تعلق تتعلق بإيه حق أدمي فلاها ثلاثة شروط Then it has three conditions Three things that should be there لكن الله كريم Maybe someone start worrying I don't know that I have this condition <laughs> Allah is كريم <crazy>, Don't worry <laughs> This is not engineering أحدها أن يقلع عن المعصية the first is that the person, if they're doing it, they stop. At the moment they're doing it, they stop. Sometimes people are like, I'm going to repent, but you know, can I repent? Like four months from now, I'm going to stop. Stop, bro. The second, an yandama ala fi'liha, to feel regret for what I've done. Hmm. It's like a really nice definition of nadam. That a nadam, regret means to feel sad and moved by what I've done. To be shaken by the crime against Allah. Against the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. وَتَمَنَّا كَوْلُهُ لَمْ يَفْعَلْ And that the person hopes that they'll never do it again. Like they, that, that, that they, sorry, they feel this sadness that they did it. Like, why did I do this? They are moved. That's why the Prophet said, أَتَوْبَةُ النَّدَمْ كَمَا رَوَاهُ أَحْمَدْ The Prophet said that this is the essence of Tawbah. Like the Prophet said, الحج, huh? عَرَفَة Hajj is Arafah because Arafah is the most important component of Hajj. Ad-Dinu, huh? Al-Nasiha. Hada gharib jidin fil Arabiya. Al-Mubtala wal Khabara mu'arrafan. Ah, ah. You say, Suhaibun tawilun. Al-Rajulu saghirun. Al-Mar'atu mu'minatun. Usually the predicate doesn't have Arif and Lam. But here, Ad-Dinu al-Nasiha. This is not Sifa. This is the Khabar of the Mubtala. Hada gharib jidin. Why is it the deen is the nasiha? If you translate it, actually, as if to so, sh- say that the edifice of religion is on nasiha, the edifice of hajj is on the arafah, and the edifice of toba is on the regret. This is the language of the Prophet Afsahul Arab al Ajam, alayhi salatu salam, the most eloquent speaker. And also, why would he say it like that? A toba to a nadam. To the Arabs say like that's wrong. You know, you know the uncles, sometimes you make a mistake in Arabic, the uncles will get you. Oh, you made a mistake. Because Arabic is very sensitive. It's not like our language. Our language, you can kind of flow. But Amiya, you can get away with it. But if you're trying to speak like really nice Arabic and you make one little mistake, somebody's going to come to you like, I'm sorry. You know, So when the Prophet would talk like that, it would, it would cause their circus to be like, a toba, a nadam, who talks like this? Why did he say, oh, now I understand. The essence of repentance is to feel regret. The third condition, he says, "Ya ahibbaina an yazima alla yauda ilayha abadan." That the person sincerely feels like, "I'm never going to go back to that again." Fin fuqida ahadu thalathati lam tasiha tawbatu. The Sheikh he says, "If one of those is not there, the tawbah is not complete." And he afdai kulla tukmili. The Tawbah is not complete. Because Allah can accept. You know, some people, maybe they don't know all this stuff. They just, oh, yeah, Allah repent. <laughs> Allah will forgive them, inshallah. فَإِنْ كَانَتِ الْمَعْصِيَةُ تَتَعَلَّقُ بِأَدَمِيِّ يِنْ فَشُرُوتُهَا أَرْبَعَ Yes, salam. Notice something here. When it comes to with Allah, it's very simple, three conditions. But when it comes to people, it gets complicated. Most of the books of fiqh are about violations with people. The smallest section of fiqh is ibadat. The biggest section of the books of fiqh is what? Mu'amalat. How we live with people. 
So he says, وَإِنْ كَانَتَ الْمَعْصِيَةُ تَتَعَلَّقُ بِآدَمِيٍ فَشُرُوطُهَا أَرْبَعَةً هذه الثلاثة وَنْ يَبْرَأَ مِنْ حَقِّ صَاحِبِهَا فَإِنْ كَانَتْ مَالًا أَوْ نَحْوَهُ رَدَّهُ إِلَيْهِ The first is that the person acknowledges like, I have violated your rights. So they work to restore those rights. That takes us to the discussion of our new Muslim brother. I never seen so many people fascinated with other people's Islam beside their own. But we know that our, our brother Andrew Tate has said some things and done some things which are inappropriate. And those things have hurt people. Although Islam abolishes what came before it, that doesn't mean that your interest into Islam has to be cautious and you have to be careful and acknowledge that you may have hurt people within the community and without outside of the community. So if the haq تتعلق بآدميين فشروطها أربعة هذه ثلاثة وأن يبرأ من حق صاحبها فإن كانت مالا أو نحوه رده إلي وإن كانت حد قذف ونحوه مكنه منه أو طلب عفوه وإن كانت غيبة استحله منها Okay, now we have to, have to explain some things really quickly. Imam al Nawi, he's mentioned this really quickly because it's not the purpose of his book. So there's a few things here that may be lost in this quick, beautiful, eloquent description of repentance that he gave when it comes to dealing with people. The first is if it involves people's property or wealth, I have to return that to them. What if I can't return it to them? Then I have to make some kind of agreement with them that I am either able to return it over time or something else if they agree to that. But it's not on the one who did wrong to negotiate the terms. You understand what I'm saying here? The second, he says, if it involves backbiting or slandering someone, you should go back to that person and seek their forgiveness. That also includes, as Imam al Maqdisi mentions, if you typed something or sent something about a person. However, the ulama, they said that's not the case for everything. For example, what if like accidentally, because oftentimes what happens really pious people, they say, oh my God, I slandered Enwar. I'm so sorry. And actually they didn't slander Enwar. And then they go to Enwar and they say, Wallahi bro, I'm so sorry I slandered you. And then it creates a problem in what? Although Enwar is a good guy, it wouldn't happen, but in the relationship. So if there's a doubt, it's better not to tell the person. Because it's going to create more what? More problems. Number two, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah talked about this in the other ulama, Al-Ghazari. If by telling them it's going to create more problems and more drama, don't tell them. And this happens a lot with what? Families, man. Right? Because... Families is where we let our guard down. We say sometimes, they, oh man, stuff Allah. Then, you know, we tell our uncle, last night I said this, then the uncle loses it and blows up the WhatsApp group. And the family's destroyed. The last is, when is it allowed to make riba? Sheikh al Bajuri, Sheikh al Azhar, he said, as we finish, inshallah, for tonight, the following situations. Do not constitute riba. This is important for therapists and counselors, case workers, you know, people on the front lines of our community, man, that deal with the pain of our community, challenges of our community. For Sheikh Sayyidina al Bajuri, if you want to write this down, these are the six exceptions where there is no riba or namima, atawallum, political oppression. Sayyidina Musa made dua against Fir'aun. Wasta'in, seeking help. Maybe someone's mistreating. And this follows what we said earlier about sexual assault and crimes and other things. Someone's being abused, someone's being mistreated. They can come forward in that situation and seek help, seek their haqq. A'una ala qiyam haqqihib. Seeking help for their rights to be established. Yes, salam. Had a Vodafone and Mobunil. The next was Tafti when I'm seeking a fatwa. 
I can't stand up people ask a question, you give an answer, and then they say, well, actually, there's something I didn't tell you. What? Then why don't you tell me? Because usually it's a what? A completely different answer. So for fatwa, and, and also there is a, the right of the mufti between the mustafti is that the mufti, like you have patient and physician rights, you have mustafti and mufti rights. The mufti doesn't go out and talk about this to people, even to his or her husband or wife, because pillow talk will get you killed. We know that, right? You go home, baby, guess what happened? Man, Anwar came to me today. Man, Anwar is lit. Anwar, da 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 da. It's not good. Anwar didn't do anything wrong. From, I'm talking about Anwar, not uh, here, but Anwar from uh, Islamic Relief. It's my man. He's going to be in trouble. Wahadar. Wahadar means what? You have to warn someone about something. Somebody's going to hurt you. Someone's going to do something to you. Someone's going to harm you. Or you know something about somebody. They want to marry someone. You know the person that they want to marry? It's crazy, like a bad person, evil, horrible, is not telling them the truth, has a lot of serious problems. You're like, well, I don't want to tell them because I don't want to backbite. Actually, the ruling is you have to tell them. The next is Sheikh Al-Bajuri says, Wa'arif. What does Arif mean? Like, maybe somebody has a strange name, like A'raj, like one eyed. He's a famous, a famous scholar. His name was A'raj. There was a great scholar. His name was Field because he was big. Uh, his name was Feel Elephant. He said, I have some mate to nafsi feeling. I call myself Elephant. As a joke, he had a sense of humor. Right? He called himself that. Actually, the tariqah of Hafs from Mu'addal is from Al Feel, one of the sonads of Imam Hafs, from him. Wadkurna. If you need to mention something that has to be said, you got to say it. If it needs to be said, you have to say it. And he says, What do you mean? It's fisqa. Fisqa al mujahiri. If you know that someone's an open fasiq, they're doing evil like bid'ah and calling people to the wrong things. And you're, it's clear. It's not something that scholars differ over. Not that. They told people pray eight times a day or something. That has to be said. I'll mention them again and then we're going to stop here, inshallah. Oppression, seeking help for rights, fatwa, warning people of others. Someone, if that's their name, if they have like a strange name that they like, they don't have a problem with it. And then mentioning the evil of somebody, for example, in a court case. Next week, inshallah, as we finish quickly what he says, afwan, وَيَجِبُ أَنْ يَتُوبَ مِنْ جَمِيعِ ذُنُوبِ Imam now he says, and a person has to repent from all their sins. And if they only repented from some of their sins, it's okay. And we're going to talk about next week, one of the greatest mistakes people make is they think Allah will not forgive them. But the majority of Ahlul Sunnah say, if anybody truly repents to Allah, Allah will forgive them. And then as we finish, inshallah, afwan ya mawlana. He says, and there are like numerous verses of Quran and hadith of Sayyid al-Akwan, alayhi salam, as well as the consensus of the scholars that show repentance is obligatory. Next week, inshallah, we'll start with the verses of the Quran about Tawbah and the first hadith about Tawbah. Barakallahu feekum. Wa sallallahu alayhi salam. تفضل Is the Muslim allowed Is the Muslim allowed to sell a defective We can take questions and answers also people have questions Is the Muslim allowed to sell defective products Does he know it's defective Then he has to tell the person This is different Because the awrat to shakhs is not like al mata that's different. And this is not called a de- this is not considered a defect in Sharia. No. No. This is not the Qiyas Ma'al Fariq, Ya Shaykh. Yeah, it's not the same thing. A woman is not a, 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 a woman or a man is not a product we sell in the store. And the rights, the rights of Adami, it's a good question, mashallah, is not the same as the rights of things we sell. It's different. We don't we don't objectify people to be like uh, sila. What's wrong with her? But this is not wrong. 
Não. Ah. I'm going to let you deal with that, Sheikh. Any other questions? Good question. Fatahullah. Any other questions before uh, uh, we go? Absolutely. And it's for the sitr. To for human beings, you have the istithna, that you are commanded to hide their mistakes. You don't have that for things you sell. It's the opposite. You are commanded, I'm commanded in the Quran and in the Sunnah to reveal the deficiencies of something I sell. But with human beings, barakalawfiq, with human beings, I'm commanded to hide. Man satra, whoever hides the mistake of a believer, if we want to say it's a mistake, I don't consider it a mistake. Satra Allahu lahu yawma al qiyamah. No, it's a good question. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah, so this is a good question. What if somebody, like, at that moment, because maybe at that moment they have the strength that they don't have later on. So at that moment, like, I resolve, I'm never going to do that sin again, then I go back to it. Then I have to repent again. Well, like, subhanAllah, there's one hadith in Bukhari, in Muslim, that we learn from our teachers. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a person who sins and repents. And Allah says, look at this person, I forgive him. Then he does the sin again and he repents. Allah says to the angels, look at this person who sinned and repented, I forgive him. Our teachers, when we read this hadith to them, they actually keep reading it beyond the page. Like the hadith stops, but they keep saying, he sinned, he sinned, he sinned, he sinned, until you stop, the shaykh. This is the, the good thing about learning hadith from teachers. And so we ask our shaykh, like, you keep going. He said, because Allah's mercy doesn't stop. Then you get the ijaz and the hadith. And he said, like, this is how this hadith has been taught, to remind us of Allah's infinite mercy. So there's a difference between someone who at that moment, sincerely, wallahi, I'm not going to do it again, because, you know, we're going to talk about it next week. Just because I'm sincere now in my repentance doesn't mean I'm not going to, like, falter. I'm a human being. So I have to keep repenting. That's, the hadith is in this chapter. We're going to read it in a few weeks the person who killed 99 people. Because he became aware he had done this after, <laughs> after 99 pe 98 people. <laughs> he woke up. Before that, he was... <laughs> he had no remorse. None of the conditions that are mentioned here, he had those conditions. Subhanallah. Barakallahu feekum wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.